So Beachmint okay. is a um, digital coast, you know, Southern California startup company that does merchandising of products online. They have maybe a half dozen sites that sell things like jewelry and fashion. It's run by two guys, Josh Berman uh, and Diego. And Josh came from um, MySpace, MySpace and Diego had a, where was he before this? I forgot. Anyway, Diego, he's a serial entrepreneur. They raised a bunch of money. They spent a bunch of money. They have about $20 million left or something like that. Pando Daily writes a story, I don't know, about two weeks ago, saying the company is in trouble, the founders are being ousted, and they're returning the $20 million. The story is uh, eventually is refuted by um, the folks over at Beachmint. Uh, Pando Daily does a correction or update or retraction, and then that's where I think things get messy. Beachmint folks feel it's not a good enough retraction. Pando Daily feels they did enough. And then it gets really interesting. A crisis management lawyer. <laughs> then it lawyer. gets weird. <laughs> yeah, interesting, weird, fascinating. Uh, Diego and the Beachman <laughs> folks hire a crisis management person because they feel like they haven't gotten the proper correction. And that person tries to either, depending on who you talk to, strong arm, threaten, cajole, convince Sarah to do what they consider a proper retraction. And, that's, I th and then Sarah comes back and says, I'll do an interview with the founders, but I need the founders to talk to me. And that's where, and then we have all different sides. People like Chamath calling, you know, Sarah Clown Town and being upset about it. And other people like Paul Carr, you know, tons of respected people taking either side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Sarah, is that an accurate description of what, what's happened? Um, I think it's mostly accurate. I mean, what I would emphasize is this was not just a crisis manager. This was Lanny Davis, someone who is known for defending Bill Clinton's sex scandals, someone who is known for defending um, African dictators who eat their opponents, someone who was um, defending Penn State in the Sandusky um, crisis, someone who New York Magazine has said in headline, this is the man you call when you've done something very, very wrong. So I think um, regardless of really our our story i think it's interesting that you i've never before seen a, a a startup refuse to talk to a media site who it was trying to influence and hire spend this much money on someone who is usually really brought in with the only intention to control and muzzle the media and change the story and um so i, I think that that's sort of like the weird part of all this that kind of freaked everyone out at the beginning of the week so that's the only part that i would add okay uh, now, let's get to brass tacks. Um, you guys have corrected the piece. Yes. And you will Multiple call times. it a correction. Now, twice. The original headline was... Well, three times because we changed the headline. So we updated the original piece. We wrote a full second story to call attention to the mistake, explaining our process, explaining why we weren't pulling down the entire story, explaining um, why we had gone with it and why we thought it was true, and um, you know, correcting what the founders were saying, which was at the time, the only correction they were making was that this had not happened yet. Hmm. Um, so we took them at their word. We put that in the story. Um, after this whole thing um, blew up, we went went ahead and changed the headline on the original piece. Only reason I hadn't done it before is, frankly, I didn't want to cover up our mistake. I think it looks a little cowardly when blogs do that, because mm -hmm. you do have this ability to come in and change what you wrote where you didn't in the print world. I think corrections are a little different for us. Yeah. Um, but, you know, beyond that, like, I think we, you know, we apologized in the update that we've done. Um, and we've said that, you know, we still have a lot of big concerns about the health of the company. The mm -hmm. company has not disputed any of those other concerns that were in our story. And when it gets to a point where someone's trying to bully or strong arm us into now saying this is a healthy company, that's where as an editor in chief and a journalist, I draw the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone knows this is a troubled company. Every blog who's even taking pot shots at us has acknowledged this is a troubled company. Um, it gets to a point where if they don't want to talk to us, if they don't care what we think of their business, that is totally their prerogative. But at a point when they're spending tens of thousands of dollars of their investor money to have someone to strong arm us into putting words on our site, I, I mean, that seems to me they do care what's on our site and probably they could just pick up the okay. phone when we're calling. So in fairness to them, their argument mm -hmm. would be, you printed two facts that were absolutely incorrect and that did incredible damage to the company. That is their position. 
That is what many people mm. believe. You said they would they were firing the founders. You said they were returning the 20 million. Those two things have not occurred. Are you sorry for printing two facts that are incredibly damaging to that yes. company? I said I was sorry the day it happened. I've, I've never said that I wasn't sorry. Look, Why I'm a do founder. People... I don't want to do damage to anyone's company. Okay. We believed it was true. We the had writer... very good sources on it. Okay. And the writer, the uh, Michael, who's a great writer, mm -hmm. who's done a good job, and I met him, and, and, and I think people think he's, you know, an up-and-coming talent. He did not call mm -hmm. the company, according to mm -hmm. uh, everybody involved. Well, so he didn't call all, the company I... for a comment. Now, is that a mistake or that not? That is not... Well, first of all, I'm not granting that that's true. Okay, well, call that's what people company. are saying, this so it's a, a claim. Company. Well, this is a company of, of a lot of people. Well, did you call the CEO and did the people in charge? Did he call Diego? That is a very different statement okay. than did he call the company. Did, well, did he call the into, company or did he call Diego? I'm not going to get into who he called at the company. Oh. He did not call and get a comment from Diego before. The story was moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we have a habit of when he has called Diego, Diego has either not told him the truth, has stonewalled him, mm. or has gone and leaked up something to another blog. We see this all the time. I saw this all the time with Mike at TechCrunch. I've seen this with Kara at All Things D. As much as it, we like to think it's Journalism 101 and it's very clean, there are many times when you have a hostile source you've dealt with over and over and over again where you don't call them before running a story. It is not as black and white as it's being painted. That having been said, since it's been disputed, we have consistently reached out to them for comment. We have consistently been open to doing an interview with them in any way they see fit. They can't continue to go around screaming, we didn't call them, we didn't call them, we didn't call them, when for now two weeks we've been saying, we would be happy to speak to you. They've got to have it one way or the other. Now that I've put this out publicly so that someone like Lanny Davis can't keep twisting it, now the rhetoric is, well, why should we have to talk to you? And it's like, okay, we'll make up your mind. Either we should talk to you or you shouldn't talk to you, but you can't have it both ways. I mean, this is like what someone like Lanny Davis does. They come in and they, you know, I don't know if you remember the movie Chicago, but like the whole tap dance scene that Richard Gere does. I mean, this is what this man does for a living. He tries to take these little technicalities and obscure a broader story. When I talked to Lanny Davis on the phone, he did not deny that our story was directionally right. He did not deny this was a company in trouble. When I tried to ask him questions beyond the two facts that these two events had not happened as of this moment, he said, I'm not getting into any of those things. I don't know anything about the health of the company. I mean, the only two things we've been asked to correct, we corrected immediately. It's bizarre. Do you think bizarre. you did, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you my take on it a little bit, is do you think you did the, the correction you did with the sort of correction occurring in the 10th paragraph or whatever it was, was a little passive aggressive and sort of calling Diego a serial liar and maybe could have been done in a little bit less of an emotional and or con you know, uh, con confrontational way. Could you have done the correction, the initial one, well, better? Well, I don't think it was actually really emotional. I think it was, I mean, I didn't- Well, calling somebody a liar, a serial liar is kind of- well, I didn't call him a serial liar. I mean, don't put words in my mouth. What did you Jason. say? I said we had issues with his with his truthfulness before, which okay. we have. Okay, well, you basically I mean, called him a liar a then. So you called him. A I liar. didn't call him a serial liar. Okay, though. but I mean, a liar. That's extreme. Okay. Um, but you know, look, that look, what I was trying to do. So my responsibility is to my readers. My responsibility is not to Diego. Right. Um, so what I was trying to do in that post is explain to our readers our methodology and what had happened and why we weren't pulling the entire post down. And unfortunately, it is material that we've had credibility issues with him before. And by the way, if you actually look at what other blogs wrote that day, many of them said, now we've heard their trouble, there's been some issues with this company before. Other people said that as well, but it doesn't behoove Lenny Davis to go after them. Okay, Rafat Ali, uh, you've been listening to this conversation. Uh, and you're, we've uh, done journalism, random acts of journalism <laughs> together over the years. We worked together at Silicon Alley Reporter, Venture Reporter. And you worked at inside.com yeah. before that, the original one. What is your take on the issue? the issues at hand, and maybe even the specific case, if you can. What's your take? Yeah, so um, this will come as a huge surprise to Sarah, but I am on her team on I this I just want to say, I can't hear um, Rafat at all. The, so. we'll, get uh, him. we'll get it. We have, okay. we have had uh, a bit of history ourselves, but here's how I look at it. Look, Beachman isn't a completely clean company. Okay, Beachman uh, isn't a clean company, Rafat says, okay. There's, I, I there's been enough okay. history there, whether the facts they ended up completely wrong. They cannot deny completely that they're in a completely healthy shape. Last year, they did a lot of um, cleaning up of the company. That's completely sort of, a, that is a fact. Um, that's one. Secondly, the, the reason I'm on Subteam Sarah in this case is because 
the people who sort of do the media startups, they're very small subset of people. And it's almost like a family. So if somebody then comes and attacks, one, we can all disagree among ourselves as family. But then if somebody else comes and then completely discredits um, somebody in the family, then you have to sort of stand up. So I take that as sort of an approach to, um, to how I look at this. Yeah. Is that I think too much mud is being smeared by sort of outsiders at companies like hers and others. Yeah. That at some point you have to stand up. Here's the interesting thing. I think those are very good points. Then, uh, story magically uh, appears from Dan Loins, who's Lions? Is it Loins? Lions or who is Lions? Loins. Loins. Lions. Dan's Loins. No, Dan Lions. Because he's lion. He's a lion. No, so he's the, like the he's the ultimate troll of trolls in journalism. Like he's the one guy who's like, as a journalist, literally formed himself into a troll by doing the Steve Jobs blog or whatever. And he, I, I can couldn't tell in this instance if he was trolling or uh, doing a, a sort of uh, bashing you and taking the bait from a competitor or, or from Beachman, who knows. But then he said, you're running out of money and your company's mm -hmm. about to die. So uh, let's clear that up. Are you running out of money? Is your company going to die? <laughs> and was he trolling, joking? Was so he trolling, joking, I mean, or what? I have no idea. I've okay. never known what motivates Dan Lyons. I find him a bizarre guy. The thing that's even so stupid about it is he didn't even do a a good job about it. We openly say how much money we've raised on our site. We've raised $3 million. And he said we had burned through $4 million and had 50000 less in the bank. And I was like, how does that math even work? Right. Um, I, I mean, so I guess this is slightly the difference between me and the founders of Beachmint. When someone says something about my company that's so ridiculously off base, I sort of quickly correct it and move yeah. on and laugh about it. Because he said we we're going to be out of business this summer. I could get hit by a bus today and we would not be out of business by this summer. We have plenty of money in the bank and our revenues are growing. It, it, it's, it would be almost inconceivable that we'd be out of business this summer. And so that's a pretty thing for easy thing for me to just put my head down and keep working and disproving. Yeah. I guess my question for the Beachman guys would be, you know, why, why can't they do this? What was the question? Why can't they? I guess, why can't they do the same? If, if I was complete, if we were completely off base in our reporting, why yeah. can't they just prove us wrong? All right. So I can answer that. I, I think I'm ready to give my judgment. <laughs> can, I, can I say one other thing? Yeah, Jason? Yeah, I yeah, think it's judge Judy all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you need a gavel. I am, I'm really pleased to hear um, Rafat say what he did. And it's similar to what Kara Swisher said. And, um, and, uh, Dylan from VentureBeat and a few other people who've kind of been around media for a long time. I do think as a community, like this does, this did start veering into an issue of what is the responsibility of a free press covering the business industry? And it's not our responsibility to be bullied by investors or a company who have millions of dollars at stake, particularly with what we know is a struggling company. It is not our responsibility to cave and throw out good reporting because they're telling us through a hired gun, we have to. It is their responsibility to talk to to us and be open and convince us our sources are wrong. And I think I was disturbed on actually, so this is the only thing I did get emotional about this week. I was disturbed on a human level that it was more important for rival blogs and other p publications to take the opportunity to slam us versus yeah. stepping back and saying, wait a minute, this is actually just a little, um, this is a little disturbing that, that this is okay and that this is what's gone on. Okay, I'm ready to give my judgment. Judge Jason enters here. the courtroom. <laughs> I'm ready to give my, uh, my <laughs> verdict here. Um, number one, it's hard to run a startup company. Uh, Sarah's a founder. Rafa's is a founder. I'm a founder. It's hard. Running a media startup is extremely hard. Getting it right in journalism is hard because you have so many different agendas. It's not a perfect science. And being mm -hmm. wrong is part of being a great journalist and correcting yourself. In this case... I think, yeah, you know, Beachman has had trials and tribulations. And I also know the Beachman guys. I'm friends with Diego. I'm friendly with Josh. More friends with Diego than Josh. So I have a pretty good perspective on both these. In fact, I consider both my friends. And I would say um, Beachman could be more upfront in working uh, with a journalist. And then that being said, uh, I think the story could have, uh, the journalist from Pando Daily, Michael, could have perhaps... Uh, done a better job of talking to the company before, history notwithstanding. That needs to be a checkbox that's done. You have to officially get those checkboxes done, calling the subjects involved in the story. I think that should have been done. That would have actually quelled things down quite a bit, I think, because there would have been right up front, Diego says this is factually not true. 
But wasn't this in the context of their, uh, and Sarah, maybe you know more than most. Are you interrupting my verse? Yeah, I am, but were, uh, were they probably not no. in, the, in the process of raising money? And wouldn't that change well, the game? Oh, if, uh, if Beachman was? Yeah. I don't think they're in the process of raising money because they have over $20 million in the bank. No, they're trying to raise money. Okay. They've been trying to raise money for quite a while. Right. They need so, 50 in order to execute their strategy. Right, and so, and you need five, and I need but that, 50. That, that I mean, makes, everybody needs something. That makes it hard so for Diego to come. we're all raising money. But doesn't that make it hard for Diego to come out and state, maybe, okay. and address things directly? So, here's the thing. The, there are probably some issues going on at Beachman, and all things are on the table at all times at a startup. I can tell you right now, that Pando Daily, Inside.com, Beach Mint, and every company is all at once running out of money because we're all investing. Therefore, we're all running out of money. We all have, if you have 18 months or 24 months or 36, we are all running out of money. So that is a true statement you can make about any startup if they're doing things correctly because you're not supposed to be investing. Yeah. So, um, and there's always offers to, any good board is looking at you know, a number of options. Stay the course, pivot, give the money back, sell, reinvest, you know, all those things are always on the table, and a good board is discussing all of those things all the time, or at least considering them. So who knows how this story, Sarah hasn't given her sources, but who knows how this story started. That being said, I think the key, the two key things here that set this off were the, the not calling of the, or a, a not enough thorough job of Michael calling, that would have toned this down 15, 20%. And then I think the correction could have been done better. And I think what happened was, Sarah, you mix the correction with the overall big picture. If it just had been a correction, clean, tight, and then here's the big picture background. But listen, this is a new you know, uh, type of situation. But just to be clear, Jason. I don't want to pay, play Monday morning quarterback. I know, I know we don't want to go back and forth yeah. here, but like, just to be clear, we did correct it up top in the original story right. and didn't put in a whole lot of editorializing. So we actually did both. So I yeah. actually don't think we confused the two. Well, here's the other um, thing, though. With the headline, though, I think the headline has to change or come down significantly, which is, which is eventually what happened. But I know, what, like, I, put, I ran into the headline, the Don't you feel like that's revisionist history, though? No, we because I'll tell you why. The headlines live in so many places now because of recirculation on blogs. When I did the Beach mm -hmm. Mint, when I was looking at your site, the headline was on the side in, like, a feature box or in a related box, and I didn't see the correction. So a casual person reads that, and they just think, okay, this is, uh, this is true. So they never actually click through to see the correction. So I think the headline has to change. Anyway, yeah. enough. I think that's a good point. I yeah. mean, but I think that's more of a point of how we run our company going forward. I mean, I think blogs yeah. are, they're very different animals and how you do corrections on them. You know, it's, everyone has their own different process, but you know, we never in any way tried to hide that we made a mistake. Okay, here we go. Okay, very good, we got it done. Uh, and let me just take a moment to thank Snap Terms. Uh, if your website doesn't have a proper terms and service and a privacy policy, uh, it could be costing you costly litigation, especially if you make an editorial error or something, let's say. I'm not saying that. <laughs> no, but you do need to have a terms of service. You do need to protect yourself. Snap Terms is a simple, affordable, and fast way to protect your website with proper terms <laughs> and privacy policies. Uh, we use Snap Terms here at this weekend. And... Um, it's fun, it's easy, and it's affordable. You could spend thousands and thousands of dollars getting your terms of service done, uh, bankrupting your company, and using uh, you know, all that important capital that you have to put towards the product. Instead, go to Snap Terms and get started for only $2.99. When you check out, use the coupon code TWIST and get 10% off your order. Um, and they have more customized solutions if you have a complex business. Snap Terms iPad Mini Contest winner is da Dave Ferrara, and they win the signed iPad Mini. So basically, this is the crazy thing the sales department comes up with, I gotta sign and ruin this poor guy's iPad mini. Like this guy, guy doesn't want my signature. You're on doing it black on black, that works. Yeah, but I'll just say best, at Jason, boom. So I ruined your iPad mini, you can try to take that off with some alcohol. Uh, but congratulations to Dave uh, for winning the iPad money, uh, mini in the Snap Terms contest. Go ahead and thank at Snap Terms. And when you think about, hey, am I protected? Think Snap Terms, get a Snap Terms for 299 instead of adding a zero or a zero and then doubling it, which is what it, Terms of service cost, if you go to like a big law firm, you're probably spending five, 10 dimes. So save a little bit of money and put that towards your product. Thanks again, Snap Terms. Okay, before, Kelly, before we move on. Oh God, we have to move on. No, uh, but the, real quickly, oh God, it's a little is hot it, in here. isn't there not a good, there's a, there's a jewel of a lesson in, the, in this last story. Uh oh, here we go. No, I, I'm not saying it's an insight. What I'm saying is in, it's something that Sarah touched on and said very briefly, which is she, her loyalty first and foremost is to her audience. Right? Of course. And I think startups don't always know that about journalists when they're in their dealings with them. Okay. Right? Yeah. And that's something to keep in mind. But also, the relationship between startup founders and 
journalists in their domain, you know, whatever field they happen to be in this case, it's tech, is something that, um, you know, people need to keep in mind. And it's, uh, you never know when that relationship can be very helpful. And I'm very helpful. It's a very clubby space. Yes. And a lot of the publications are invested in yeah. or have other relationships. All Things D, owned by Rupert Murdoch. They cover Rupert Murdoch. Excel, Investor in Pando yeah. Daily. Mike Arrington has a fund. Invest in the startups that they publicize in tech. Crunch. It's all but, very but incestuous at times. Can I just say, yeah. um, to Tyler's point, I mean, I think the other thing that's important to note is, you know, I think there's a lot of founders who have these, like, really imperious, you're here to do my bidding relationships with journalists or mm. attitude towards journalists. And I think this is like a sign of when that really breaks down. I yeah. mean, I think, it, you know, you need to know that there will come a point, whether it's the current startup you're doing now or a future one, where you will need the press and you will need a relationship with the press. And, I, you know, Jason, this is something you've always done well, whether you've been on top or you've been on the bottom. Um, you know, it, having someone know, like, look, you can trust me. I'm not going to try to fuck you over if you call me to get confirmation on a story. Um, that's an important relationship to have. You know, another L.A. company who's been troubled, who we've covered, you know, it, a lot is Shoe Dazzle. And, you know, interesting because it's also content commerce, same as Beachman. Now, there have been many times when we've had uh, a lot of rumors coming out of uh, sh people close to Shoe Dazzle um, because they've never screwed us over or lied to us. We have a different relationship with them. And I feel like I can call Brian Lee. I feel like I can call Brian's investors. I feel like I can say, hey, is this true? And sometimes they say it's not true. We think it is. We run with the story anyway, and we have. Sometimes they're able to give us enough evidence that it's not that we don't. And they haven't liked everything we've written about, but they have come to us in the spirit of, yes, we are going through a troubled time, but this isn't right or this isn't fair. At the I end of the when day, you come at journalists yeah. and say, we aren't going through any troubles at all. We don't know what the hell you're talking about. Shut up. That's yeah. not conducive to a conversation. I think being honest and, and transparent is a, a key virtue and expectation of founders and CEOs in today's age. And in fact, it makes you more endearing and charming. Uh, and mm -hmm. people can buy into you as a leader much more. And, you know, we've all, the three of us at this table, have all worked together for a long time, and Rafa worked with me. I've always tried to be as honest as possible with the people who work for me. I've actually just extended that to the mm -hmm. people, to the public. And I, you can't write any news about me because I write about it myself before anybody yeah. gets a chance. So when This Week In went from a network of 20 shows to just me and Kevin, and we sort of said, this isn't a good business, I wrote it first. So then everybody else had to just link to my post. I had the high ground. I, I think you've got to just get out there before everybody. My philosophy. I mean, you, you had your own episode where TechCrunch for a, a, two years, it seemed, it would do. There was like a, the classic, uh, you got hit kind of hard for a while on TechCrunch. Well, when Mike doesn't like you anymore, he's going to demolish you. I mean, um, uh, but not that Sarah could speak to that. Um, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs>